Good morning, and welcome to the Global Energy Institute's Energy Innovate series, where we convene experts to discuss the innovation that is driving America's energy future. Let me once again start by thanking the sponsor of Energy Innovates, Siemens Energy, and invite you to watch this short video from our sponsor. If the one constant in life is change, shouldn't we all change for the better? Let's champion the energy transformation. Why can't global challenges become opportunities? Let's make our ideas a reality. What if an idea became a solution for millions? Let's transform our natural resources. Shouldn't reliable, affordable and sustainable energy be for all? Let's see people as the catalysts of real change. Isn't it time we harnessed our collective energy? Let's galvanize change in our homes and offices and industries. Because shouldn't our technology serve us today and tomorrow? Let's energize society. So today we're focusing on plastics innovation for sustainability and climate progress. And I'm very pleased to welcome Chris John, President and CEO of the American Chemistry Council, to set the stage for our conversation. Thanks for being here, Chris. Thank you. So 27 years ago, I started to work with the American Plastics Council, now the Plastics Division at ACC. So it feels like I've come full circle or part of the circular economy, if you will. In that time, the industry you represent has done amazing, innovative work to be part of the solution to our global sustainability and climate challenges. So, so what are the new approaches from the chemical sector that make plastics innovation such an important contributor to climate solutions? Really, uh, thank you for the question, Marty, and, and appreciate the partnership with the chamber uh, and your team. I, when I think of this issue, I think of two ways in innovations in plastics are helping drive climate solutions. The first is that plastic materials literally enable a lower carbon and clean energy future through many applications across a variety of sectors. And just let me give you a few examples. In the auto industry, plastics uh, result in significantly lighter vehicles that improve fuel efficiency. Uh, in the built environment, plastic foam uh, insulation reduces energy consumption in buildings. In consumer goods like food, plastic packaging extends the shelf life of food, which reduces food waste and avoids emission. Uh, you will also see when we look at alternative energy, um, whether it's solar or wind energy production, uh, you use plastics to so encase solar panels, you make the blades of a wind turbine. And in these applications, not only do plastic help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it actually helps create green energy. And, uh, you know, so if you think of it like a, uh, uh, your gas tank in your car, not only can you drive further, but the gas tank is fill refilling itself as you go. I think the, the other piece that I look at in regards to innovation is uh, our industry is becoming more circular every year. And with advanced uh, molecular recycling technology, we can break down mixed plastic feedstocks to their basic building blocks, which then can be used to make entirely new plastics or other products. And these um, uh, materials are ultra clean quality plastics that can go into uh, very demanding applications such as uh, you know medical devices for example so uh, this helps address some of the traditional challenges we have with um, recycling as you and i know it and so if you think of things like snack wrappers or toothpaste tubes uh, really advanced recycling is the only way to deal with those issues and so we've seen significant investment in this space over the past few years uh, over six billion dollars in projects have been announced uh, by a number of our member companies. For example, Eastman Chemical Company recently announced uh, plans to build one of the world's largest plastic molecular advanced recycling facilities in Tennessee. Uh, CP Chem and Braven have reached a long-term supply agreement where Braven's gonna convert mixed, difficult to reduce plastics into a feedstock for making new circular plastics. And ExxonMobil is, is partnering with Plastic Energy on advanced recycling uh, facility in France expected to be one of Europe's largest con to convert plastic waste into feedstocks, quality polymers. So Marty, that was a long answer to your question, but there's a lot happening very quickly in this space and it's really exciting to see it take off. 
Great. That's really, it, it, it's fascinating to hear about all that. And obviously the, the, the industry has put a lot of effort into innovating about the products that we all rely on. Uh, but as you said, also on the, on the creating the circular economy. So if we want to get more granular in the, in the policy side of this, I mean, what are some of the specific federal policies that you believe are needed to help advance those efforts? Yeah, it's a really important question, Marty. And I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, how important uh, the role of government, particularly the federal government, has to play here. And we're really looking for Congress to act quickly to pass sensible policies that enable the innovations that we're talking about and to accelerate these private sector investments that we're seeing so we can maximize the impact. So our members, America's Plastics Makers, have called on Congress uh, and we've got five actions for sustainable change that we think will jumpstart a circular economy. So the first piece of that is to require all plastic packaging to include, include at least 30% recycled plastic by 2030. The second piece is to develop a modern regulatory system to enable the rapid scaling of this advanced recycling technology, and also at the same time grow mechanical recycling. We still need that to solve the problem. The third piece is um, to create a national framework for plastics recycling that includes national recycling standards to help local communities recycle better and engage the entire plastics value chain. Uh, the fourth piece uh, specific to climate is we're asking and calling for the National Academy of Sciences to study greenhouse gas emissions from all materials, including plastics, to help guide our policy going forward. And then the last piece is to establish an American-designed uh, producer responsibility system to help increase recycling, not only the access, but education and outreach to consumers. So this is really kind of a comprehensive approach to a challenging issue. And we really need, as I said, Congress to act quickly on it. Unfortunately, some in Congress are, are taking a, uh, I think a counterproductive approach to this and are pushing bans, are pushing taxes, curbs on production. Um, we're even seeing in the reconciliation bill right now, um, potential taxes uh, as a pl uh, on plastics as a pay for in that bill, which actually will do nothing to address the issue of plastic waste. And so, there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences there, mainly disruption of American supply chains for needed uh, uh, equipment and products. And it's also going to have the unintended consequence of uh, making a lower carbon future uh, more difficult to achieve. So we think we've got a better way to address the plastic waste challenge going forward. Chris, that's really exciting. I'm looking to see how, how hard the, the, the industry itself is leaning into the, to these questions. And we certainly look forward to working, working with you in partnership on that. You know, as I noted at, at almost 30 years ago, as I was working with the Plastics Council on, on some of these same issues, I think a common theme is that you know, trying to get the, uh, both the general public and even the you know, elected officials to fully appreciate not only what the industry has done, but the role that, that, that plastics and, and the chemicals industry more broadly you know, plays in our daily lives. So as we think more about kind of moving forward, I mean, I guess I'd like to ask you, what do you see? What are the, you know, what, what are the challenges that are still facing the chemicals and plastic sectors and, and their value chains in helping to accelerate the development and deployment uh, of the recycling infrastructure uh, and in meeting the, you know, the climate goals that your members have set out? Yeah, it's a, it's a really smart question, Marty. We've come a long way since you were here, but we've still got work to do. And I think uh, I've, I've touched on a little bit, but it's the biggest challenge we really have right now is the issue of waste. And just to be clear for everyone watching here, plastics do not belong in our environment, end of story. And so America's plastics makers are taking meaningful actions to help solve this issue. This is an engineering problem and it can be solved with technologies that exist today. Uh, unfortunately, we've got some who think the solution is to ban or eliminate plastics altogether. Uh, but again, as I mentioned before, that's going to create unintended consequences, particularly for climate and greenhouse gas emissions. So as we look at all the uh, essential applications of plastic across the board, whether it's reducing emissions, reducing water use, preserving habitat, improving our uh, hygiene, uh, it's, there's, the benefits can't be ignored. And to solve this waste issue, the industry, we are deploying really our, our best and brightest scientists and engineers. We're already implementing these solutions around the globe, and we just need help from the federal government to accelerate that change. So we're really excited about the possibilities and uh, look forward to working with everybody in DC to make that happen. Um, 
Great. Well, listen, I, I appreciate that. If you don't mind, we got a, a couple of questions from, from the audience as well. Uh, we were asking, you know, what type of measurements are you using to document results of plastics waste reduced? So, uh, uh, so right now, uh, recycling rates, frankly, are rather low. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, snack wrappers, toothpaste tubes, that kind of things are not uh, handled very well by the traditional recycling system we have. So we do have data on uh, what we're doing in terms of plastic recycling now. There is a baseline there. And uh, we'll be able to measure against that as we go forward. And then, as I said, uh, in our first plank of our plan was the goal to have 30% uh, of plastic packaging recycled um, by the year 2030. So we do have some metrics by which we can measure progress. And look, look, we're happy. We're two thirds of the way through 2021, and that's that's the urgency we're feeling to get Congress to act to help enable us moving forward to meet those um, to meet those measurements. Great. Maybe, maybe one, one one final question. It was you mentioned that mechanical recycling is still a very important part of the equation. Uh, you know, clearly we're going to need the the innovation of advanced recycling to get us to the goal that we all you know that, that we all share. But just focusing on the mechanical side for a moment. I mean, what what are your you know, is your sense of where, where we stand now? Um, uh, how how are we doing on that front? Yeah, I think that there's uh, significant opportunities for growth there as well. Um, particularly for plastics, and uh, you know we're we're working with everybody in the plastics value chain, and I referred to that briefly earlier, mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, meet these goals, and we're going to need mechanical recycling to grow as well. That's why we're looking for national standards. Uh, to uh, so, you know, you go to different jurisdictions, and they have different rules and different you know some some things you can put in your blue bin, and some things you can't, and that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And that's why we're looking for a more uniform standard. To enable that going forward and but we're going to need mechanical recycling to expand significantly to be successful in addressing this challenge going forward great well again as you noted it, it, it's it, it's the innovation i think that we've got to be able to you know to help promote and we appreciated your partnership with us last year as we got the energy act passed and have all this you know federal research dollars going into the innovation that's going to be necessary to get us to our broader climate sustainability goals uh, so, Chris, I really appreciate you, you joining us today. Thank you again. Uh, appreciate your partnership uh, and, uh, and, and that, that we share with both you and your team. You've got a great team to work with. Absolutely. Back Right back at you, Marty. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll see you soon. Take care. Now I'm delighted to welcome Cheryl Telford, Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of EHS for the Comores Company. Cheryl, thank you for joining us today. Marty, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, I'll let you give us some insights into what the company makes and what it does, but suffice to say that Comores is a market leader in the manufacture of advanced performance materials that we've all come to rely on. So let's jump in. Cheryl, plastics are ubiquitous. It's hard to imagine a day where we don't use them and rely on them, but their importance to modern society is often overlooked and taken for granted. As you provide us an overview of Comores, can you also help identify for us some of the important applications of plastics-based products, including those produced by Comores, of course, that the general public may not appreciate? Absolutely, and so the Comores company, for those that aren't familiar, manufactures some really, really essential chemistries whether it's TiO2 or titanium dioxide, whether it's our advanced performance materials business that manufactures the fluoropolymers that you referenced, or our thermal and specialty solutions businesses that, that deals with low GWP uh, refrigerants, non-ozone depleting. We believe that our chemistry is essential to the functioning of modern society and furthering societal progress and all of our shared sustainability goals. But when you talk specifically about plastic-based products, fluoropolymers are an example of specialty performance materials with unique characteristics that really go into so many numerous applications. 
At the same time, I would say across the chemistry industry, whether it's fluoropolymers more broadly, the, the understanding of the role of chemistry in meeting societal needs and sustainable, uh, sustainability is not well understood. And so as, a, as an example for fluoropolymers in, in particular, they're used in everything from renewable energy. They enable green hydrogen. They enable 5G battery storage, lithium batteries, um, medical devices. The materials or the, the end applications of these fluoropolymers are so incredibly important to society. But if I take a step back and ask my mother, what are fluoropolymers? She's going to say, I have no idea. And why should I care? And that's our challenge as an industry to begin to translate for the broader community what it is that these chemistries deliver, the value of these chemistries to each and every person around the globe every single day. You know, so bottom line, chemistry enables the solutions that solve some of our world's greatest challenges, whether it's the fluoropolymers that I just discussed, the fluorochemicals like non-ozone depleting, low GWP refrigerants, or TiO2 that helps keep food fresher and buildings cooler, chemistry is vital to our world, period. Our challenge is to ensure that we are producing and using these chemistries across our value chains safely and responsibly. Great. Well, I appreciate that. And certainly we, we need to have a better a better understanding of the general public on the important role that, that, that chemistry and certainly plastics and, and these performance materials play in our lives. And a big part of that is the innovation of the industry. So, in fact, our Energy Innovates program has focused on the innovative nature of the energy sector and its downstream applications and the role that innovation will play in meeting our climate and sustainability challenges, those global challenges. So what are the sustainability priorities for Comores and how do they focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in particular? And more broadly, how do they address those global sustainability challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. And so our commitment to sustainability is unwavering and it's incorporated into everything that we do. It's part of our ethos. It's part of our company strategy. It really is all of our 6,500 employees around the globe and, and how they execute against that ethos. But in particular, to your point, we have some very bold climate goals. We announced in April of this year, more progressive, more profound climate goals. Uh, to include a 60% absolute reduction in our scope one and two emissions by 2030, which is aligned with a science-based target on a journey to net zero 2050. And we're gonna accomplish that in a number of ways. We'll accomplish that, of course, through energy efficiency work. We'll accomplish that through uh, renewable energy, but we're also working in partnership with others to test new technologies, new capabilities, to include you know, hydrogen. How do we apply those technologies at our sites and bring the data and that capability to the broader universe so that we can scale those technologies up even further and even faster? And to me, that's really critical is, is that notion of we need to do what we as a company can and must do. The time to act on climate is now. We are fully committed to taking those actions, but our chemistries also really are a key component in how the world will achieve carbon zero, net zero by 2050. And we have to do this working in partnership I truly believe that all of us want to get to that ultimate goal of net zero 2050. I also believe 
that to get there, it's going to take partnerships, the likes of which none of us have ever seen, whether it's partnerships within the business community, with academics, government support, with NGOs. We all need to be all in. We're committed to be there from the Comores perspective, both addressing our issues in-house at our manufacturing sites, delivering chemistries that really are innovative and help to solve some of those world's greatest challenges. But it's gonna take a collaboration, like I said, unlike any of us have ever seen, to really get to our ambition at 2050. Great. Well, well, Cheryl, I think you, you you said it very well, and I think that you know we would certainly agree completely with you about the need need for partnership. I think the only way to get to the, the the ambition that we're all striving for is to make sure we have the technology available, you know, the policy in place, and the market market signals to you know to get the business community to continue innovating the way that Comores has and and that the industry has. Uh, so I think that's really impressive what you've set out, you know, for the company, but. You know, with such bold goals, do you ever sit up at night wondering how you'll be able to achieve them? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And I truly believe that reaching net zero, for example, by 2050 is a moonshot. Bottom line, it's a moonshot. But I also believe that through innovation, technology and partnerships, the likes of which we haven't seen, I believe that getting there is possible. I believe that none of us is as smart as all of us at the end of the day. And so it's, it's through that combined effort of individual companies, government, all of the stakeholders, partnerships, we will get there. And frankly, we must get there. And I, I use the word moonshot, not lightly, right? That was something we, well, some of us might remember, you know, as, as an aspiration. We didn't know how we were going to get there. And we did. As a, as a country, as a, as, as a globe, we delivered. This is the same type of thing. And I believe in our people. I believe in our technology. But I also believe and this is a different dimension of ESG, to really make this happen, we have to fully embrace and make sure that we are, we are enabling from the business community, each and every individual to bring their whole selves to work, that we are encouraging that innovation, that we are making our work places safe for people to bring ideas. And just as a quick aside, when we set one of our, our, our corporate responsibility commitment goals, we one of them was to reduce by 99% or greater fluorinated organic emissions from our manufacturing sites. And we had an idea of how we were going to get there. But as it turns out, with some great innovation and collaboration with our team internally, frankly, as well as with consultation with others externally, our team pushed back and they said, wait a minute, we can do this in a much more elegant way. There's a far better way to achieve this. And we listened and thank goodness they brought those ideas forward. We all have to keep creating that environment. In Comores, we call it holistic safety. We want you to be physically safe but we want you to feel safe in all dimensions of work. Bring your ideas, bring your, your, your concerns. And frankly, that worked for us because we are now poised to continue our progress, which has been pretty amazing, I might add, against that goal, but in different ways than we ever would have expected. Well, I think that's great to, to to focus on the you know the need for the collaboration and empowering your team to be able to pursue the you know the goals that the company sets out there. If I could get a little more granular on, on another kind of theme of the of the event today, let me get a sense from you on, on what the role that uh, of the recycling infrastructure in achieving Comores goals. 
Yeah. So, so really good question. And, you know, when I think about recycling, I think of work that we have underway, for example, in our TIO2 business. And the TIO2 business is partnering with universities, other companies, researchers in Europe, and they're calling it the Recycle to Reclaim program. And what they're seeking to accomplish is how do you get that TIO2 out of plastics? How do you get it back so that we don't need to continue to manufacture as much TIO2, you know, potentially, uh, and, and it can be reused? Those are the types of thinking on circularity that are really profound, that are really intriguing, that I think really is going to create uh, require creativity across all of the market uh, places and across all industry. How do we get away from the, you know, the 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 make to waste, you know, continuum, and really start thinking about product design upfront, and how do we make all of our processes more circular? So that's how we're thinking about it within the company. Recycle to, uh, to Reclaim is a very good example of what we're thinking. There's still a lot more work to do, and I would argue here as well, plenty of opportunity for partnership, for infrastructure, for all kinds of collaboration to, to make this a reality for everyone. Great. Well, Cheryl, I really appreciate the insights you provided us on how on how your company and I know many of your many of your colleagues across the industry are are uh, are pursuing these the, these challenges, but uh, not just challenges, but there are opportunities as you as you pointed out. So I just want to thank you again for joining us today and contributing to our conversation and say how much I look forward to working with you and your team. Thank you, Marty. It was such a pleasure to be here today. And I too look forward to how we can work collaboratively together to advance these goals of sustainability and policy. And look, we've, we've got great businesses. We've got great people. Let's make a difference together. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Christopher Guth, the Senior Vice President at the Chamber's Global Energy Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome Mary Draves, the Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President for Environment, Health and Safety for Dow. Good morning, Mary. Hey, Chris. Good morning. How are you? I'm excellent. Now, Dow is one of the world's largest and most innovative science and manufacturing companies, which means you produce a lot of product. Can you give us an overview of Dow's leading role in plastics innovation and products? as well as the importance of those products to not only modern life, but also to addressing environmental concerns. Yeah, Chris, again, thanks for having me today in such, a, yeah, uh, such an important conversation we're all having. Um, really enjoyed uh, listening to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Cheryl Telford, and also Chris, Chris from uh, American Chemistry Council talking uh, about their uh, particular areas. You know, for us, plastics, as we know it, is an indispensable material um, for the world's consumers and, and really a vital part of our journey towards that zero carbon future. You know, we, in fact, we don't believe it we'll be able to reach the UN sustainable development goals without plastic. You know, if we think about what plastic provides, that lightweight in plastic, you heard Chris talk about it a little bit earlier in, in vehicles, but it also provides all kinds of different um, applications for growing populations around the world. Greater access to things like fresh food, safe drinking water, medicines, you know, it also drastically reduces food spoilage and waste. Um, in, and we all know that waste, a uh, food waste is a significant contributor to carbon emissions um, globally. You know, we also see that plastics have approximately four times less environmental cost, um, particularly when it comes to carbon emissions compared to other materials. 
And they offer a more affordable and really healthier quality of life for billions of people. You know, at the same time, we're, uh, you know, we're facing an unacceptable consequence of, of plastic. And Chris mentioned this earlier, too much plastic uh, waste is entering uh, like our oceans, our rivers, and our natural environment. And this just cannot continue. You know, at Dow, we're working on, you know, a more sustainable and circular economy for plastics. Uh, we have over 400 brand owners have responded to consumer demand for more sustainable products, you know, really by making commitments to design packaging for reuse and recyclability. You know, so we're really focused on that, you know, as well as using more recycled materials in their products. You know, Dow uses material science expertise. And you heard Cheryl talk about, you know, our, what do our chemistries bring to life, you know, to help those brand owners really deliver on those fronts. You know, we've worked with such brands as Kellogg's, you know, and I, I remember Kellogg's as a kid uh, and their bare naked granola uh, brand to to really transform um, some of their products to make those packages fully recyclable using recyclable ready material, which is an innovation of Dow's. You know, Dow has also begun to sell a new line of mechanically recycled plastic resins, you know, a family of products that can be used in either flexible or rigid pass, uh, plastic uh, applications. You know, we offer a broad range of, of other products that can enable even more plastics to be recycled, which is very important. So the demand and the design side of circularity are really important. And enabling additional end markets for those plastics is also important. So, you know, we're working with partners around the globe. And you heard Cheryl mention this also is that, you know, collaboration is key including universities, um, you know, to really figure out how to construct different things. And one of those innovations that we have right now is this polymer modified asphalt roads that has post-consumer uh, recycled plastic. One of these roads is, is near um, where I live, you know, and this technology not only provides us with a way to keep waste, you know, out of the environment, but that early research has demonstrated that those recycle, using those recycled plas uh, plastics to modify asphalt actually improves the durability and road performance. You know, pilot projects for us around the world, we've laid more than 107 kilometers or 66 miles of pavement, and that's diverted over 220,000 pounds or 100 metric tons of plastic waste from landfills. And, you know, and they've met all appropriate regulations and performance specifications. You know, so we're also seeing that this new application has the potential to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, energy com uh, consumption, and then that further need for resurfacing. So a lot going on in, in, in the space for us with our products. Now, as you, Cheryl and Chris have all succinctly noted, the plastics producers are leading on sustainability and addressing it head on. But how does the policy environment impact your innovation agenda? Yeah, Chris, I think that simply um, good policy environment has and can propel in, a, in the innovation agenda. And you heard Chris talk about this earlier. Um, the unprecedented collaboration that we're going to need, though, is really key. I mean, we, we know that we can't do this alone, as Cheryl said. Um, so we've got to work together with plastics producers like Dow, federal, state, local governments, brand owners, retailers, consumer groups, environmental NGOs and the like. You know, we've really got to work together for we're going to do get to net zero by 2050 and really create the circularity for the plastics that we need. And I like Cheryl. I believe that we can do this. We have brilliant minds among us. Uh, you know, and there are a lot of policy tools that that can help us. You know, we talked a bit already about how we're working to meet the demand of our customers with more sustainable uh, packaging. You know, we work with closed loop partners um, in the supply of that recycled content to meet the demand that we talked about earlier is stuck at about 6%. So we need more supply and more collections, a better recycling system um, to meet that demand. And, you know, as we see a lot of U.S. residents don't have that access to, access to curbside recycling. You know, where I live now, I don't have access to curbside recycling. So my husband takes the recycling sometimes three times a week um, to the recycling center. You know, and, and we have way too many different systems that are confusing for people, you know, over 9,000 in the U.S. alone. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we support the EPA's recycling goal to reach that 50% recycling rate by 2030, you know, and are looking forward to the release of the national recycling strategy. Uh, you know, Dow and the American Chemistry Council, you know, we also support the Recycling Partnerships Producer Responsibility Proposal, which is a uniquely American um, responsibility system. 
you know, and there, there are really too many communities struggling to provide that basic recycling services to their residents, you know, including Louisville, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Syracuse, also a lot of urban areas, rural areas. There are communities though that have infrastructure but need more education like LA, Chicago, Houston, Philly, Dallas. And there are communities that just need updated infrastructure and education like Detroit, New York. So good recycling access in a city is, is that every home has a recycling container on par with their regular trash. Automatic recycling pickup is there. We have sustained funding and we help educate uh, people on how to recycle prop properly. Um, Senator Stabenow and Senator Portman's Recycle Act has provided um, money for education, which was included in the bipartisan infrastructure framework, which was a great start to this. And according to that, uh, the recycling par partnership, if we enable recycling for everyone in the U.S., you know, it's estimated to deliver a very positive ROI, which is what we all want, that economic benefit of over 30 billion over 10 years and, you know, 200,000 new jobs. And more importantly, it saves also 700, over 700 metric tons of CO2. You know, we also appreciate Senator Sul Sullivan and Senator Whitehouse efforts to get SOS and SOS2 signed into law. And we're very strong supporters of the American Chemistry Council's call for 30% recycled content by 2030, which Chris mentioned earlier. And finally, I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention that support and the need for a strong global agreement on plastics to help tackle waste in the environment and urging all governments and stakeholders worldwide to press for a treaty resolution at the upcoming United Nations meetings. Now you mentioned recycling, as did Cheryl. What does advanced recycling look like and why is it so important to solving this uh, circularity? Yeah, you know, Chris, I mean, advanced recycling is really critical to the suite of opportunities um, that we need to bring in order to meet that demand for creating a more circular economy for practice, uh, excuse me, for pl plastics. You know, and we have to scale up both the idea of mechanical and traditional recycling, which many of us are, are more familiar with, and then advanced recycling. You know, they're both absolutely, you know, critical. You know, if you're like me, you're, you may be familiar with more of that traditional recycling, which doesn't change the chemical structure of the, the used plastic, but it's, you know, it's just maybe be, it's mechanically recycled and remanufactured into something else. Advanced recycling, and you heard Chris uh, speak to this, it is, you know, really about taking and changing the chemical structure. You know, and it's really kind of an umbrella term that we hear uh, for a variety of different technologies that, you know, break plastic back down into basic molecules so that we can use it to make newer high quality materials. Um, it, you know, it's really critical because there are some plastics that just cannot be mechanically recycled. So we have to have options. And for those harder, to, to recycle used plastics, we need this idea of advanced recycling. You know, you know it's also critical because we can use advanced recycling to create um, the, you know, the use of materials like food grade and medical grade products, which have a higher requirements um, from a, a quality standard. And, and last, advanced recycling processes um, are expected to save us, you know, 1.5 tons of CO2 for, uh, for each ton of recycled plastics compared to incineration. Um, you know, and we, all, we know that, in, that incinerating plastics sometimes can be a very common practice. You know, at Dow, um, we're working with Mira Technology to support that rapid scale up of new advanced recycling processes. Mira's uh, technology um, has demonstrated that it can recycle all forms of plastic, including the multi-layer, the flexible, uh, which is are harder to uh, you know to recycle, and often many times are sent for incineration and landfill. So we've seen the industry invest over time six billion to scale up the recycling, over five billion in advanced recycling since 2017, and we need to do more of that. Um, we also know that, you know, over 14 states have, have recently passed laws to enable that scale up of advanced recycling, which is another example of how policy supports innovation and circularity. You know, Representative Haley Stevens and Representative Anthony Gonzalez are both leading important advanced recycling legislation, and we really appreciate their active engagement as well. Now, as I mentioned, Dow is has thrived as a uh, an innovator for more than a century. 
Um, you've mentioned several policies across the, the US, but you also mentioned the criticality of having um, global cooperation. Mm -hmm. So as an innovator, I suspect you can probably um, identify it when you see it. What are some of the innovative, if any, policies that you've seen around the world that um, we should look at here within the US? You know, I, I, I will I'll say this, Chris, I think that, you know, we all could talk about, you know, innovation, but I think you see um, in various parts of the country, just let's talk maybe a bit more about recycling, you know, how, how, how do we encourage people to recycle? And that's one of the things we need to do in the US. Um, we can take a page out of the playbook, what we see in the European theater, um, or, you know, in, um, uh, in Asia Pacific region. So I think there are many opportunities for us to learn from others. And as Cheryl mentioned, again, you know, this is about uh, us partnering and, and partnering together to bring the best um, uh, forward, you know, to help us all move this, move this forward. It looks like we have maybe um, time for one audience question. Um, hope this doesn't catch you off guard. Um, how did China's 2018 national sword policy affect producers' relationship with plastics and recycled materials? Yeah, you know, Chris, um, it's in, I am not actually the expert on this one, so I, I apologize. I, um, that's a, a bit of a specific thing. I think, you know, what you know, what we're, you know, what we're looking at is as we look across the, the globe is, is to say, okay, like you had mentioned earlier, what are the best policies that we can bring forward um, that we can, uh, you know, speak to that will help us all advance um, what we need is one is getting plastics out of the environment, getting them back into reusable materials, um, and, you know, advancing uh, circularity in the industry. Well, thanks, Barry. Excuse me. Thank you very much for bringing your expertise and your passion to our program this morning. And we certainly um, look forward to continuing to work with you and your peers across the industry um, to solve this very critical challenge. Great, Chris. Thanks for having me. And I hope that, you know, if there's one thing that we all learned is, is that we all need to work together, right? Unprecedented collaboration um, to really uh, move this, move this uh, effort forward. So thanks for having me today. Thank you, Christopher and Mary. And now we have a different perspective from the many iconic brands from Procter & Gamble. I'd like to welcome Brent Heist, the Director for Packaging and Sustainability at Procter and & Gamble, uh, and look forward to the discussion. Brent, welcome. Thank you, great to be here with you today. Thanks so much. Um, how is Procter & Gamble working to advance a circular economy for your packaging, for the packaging space especially? Yeah, and it, just a, a brief history of, of P&G as we get into this discussion. So we've been around for a very long time. Procter & Gamble was founded in 1837 as the, the combination of the respective soap and candle businesses of William Procter and James Gamble. Uh, they combined together, uh, quite honestly, to drive scale uh, of accessing their raw material, which at the time to make soap and candles uh, was the waste pig fat from the pork processing industry that existed in Cincinnati. Um, those candles and soap were then packaged uh, into wooden crates with sawdust dunnage to be shipped out to consumers across the growing U.S. at the time. Uh, and it was also interesting because those wooden crates that were used for shipping, uh, back before the days of Twitter, if you wanted to get your message out, uh, you might grab one of those wooden crates, uh, take it down to uh, the corner in your town or city, uh, stand on your soapbox to get your message out. So we, we recognize that P&G has a history in a circular economy where uh, waste materials were used to make useful products and packaging. Uh, and those uh, products and packaging uh, found uh, uh, an end of life that was useful as well. So if we fast forward to today, then uh, we're stating our uh, intents in further developing the circular economy of today through our Ambition 2030 program. And we have two primary packaging goals uh, that are stated in Ambition 2030. Uh, the first is that 100% of our packaging uh, will be either recyclable or reusable. 
And it's important in that statement to uh, stress that we view recyclability as recyclable through the entire system. So collection, sorting, processing, and then valuable end markets for that material. Um, the other goal uh, is to reduce our use of virgin petroleum derived resin by 50%. Uh, and we recognize that probably one of the, the major ways that we will be able to do that is by replacing that virgin resin with PCR, recycled resin. Uh, that will certainly help to drive the circular economy as we will be uh, a valuable end market for those materials uh, that we've uh, put into the system and designed to be recyclable. Um, very critical then for us as we're moving forward that we understand what is recyclable, uh, where there might be gaps and challenges in the system today, and where we can work to help enable that circular economy. And I, I will mention one more thing too, we don't just look at recyclability and reducing virgin resin. All of our projects as we're making these changes and improving the circularity of our packaging, uh, we're also looking at the broader impacts. And we recognize that by using circular materials and designing for recyclability, uh, we reduce the energy impact uh, or energy inputs into our packaging, which certainly has uh, climate benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's that's really important. Uh, what kinds of innovations has P and G developed that are helping to advance your circular uh, your circular priorities? Yeah, we're really proud of two in particular uh, that I'd like to share today. Uh, the first uh, is a solvent process to recover polypropylene uh, at a high value. So polypropylene is used widely in the industry for caps and closures. It's very valuable for that purpose, uh, both for its physical properties, uh, what it gives you as far as performance, uh, as well as the ability to color it. Uh, to distinguish uh, between different packages. So, for example, we know in our Tide business, uh, for our Tide liquid laundry detergent, consumers tend to shop the aisle based upon the cap color. They identify the scent or the variant that they're looking for by that cap color. So it's very important uh, that we're able to consistently deliver that uh, cap color uh, for our consumers to be able to efficiently shop the category. The challenge today with recycling polypropylene is, in many cases, the available recycled content uh, is darkish grays or black colors, uh, which doesn't work uh, for a consumer goods company where the, the color is part of the equity. So we developed internally a solvent recovery process uh, for polypropylene that cleans out the color and the contaminants, uh, everything that's been put into these uh, caps and closures um, that makes them difficult to reuse as PCR. This recovered polypropylene that has never broken the polypropylene chain, it's remained intact as a polymer, uh, is in a virgin-like quality. Uh, we can now use it back into our caps and closures really as a one-for-one -one replacement uh, for the virgin material that we have been using. Recognizing that PNG is not in the recycling processing space, we've licensed this technology out to a company called Pure Cycle Technologies, uh, who is scaling it up scaling up the technology, and this high quality recycled polypropylene is going to be available to the entire industry. The second area that we're really active in today is trying to understand better the consumer business model for reusable packaging. Uh, we understand that you know there has been a, a reusable packaging past. Consumers today are not attuned to this. So uh, we're trying to learn what is it that will enable our consumers uh, to want to use re reusable packaging, uh, what needs to be true. And we're being very careful about this because we understand that if we turn consumers off from reusable packaging, they might not be willing to try the next iterations of it. So we've had tests out there. Two most notable ones recently uh, have been in our OLA business where we have a, a refill pod that the consumer puts in back into their jar uh, at home. Uh, the other a uh, major uh, intervention and test that we've been doing in this space is our hair care business in Europe, where we have reusable packaging and lightweight uh, polyethylene pouch refills, so significantly reducing the amount of plastic used in that system, uh, and certainly gives the consumers the opportunity of having a durable package that they reuse consistently 
uh, but they can still shop for their variant, their uh, preferred scent uh, through the refills that they get at the store. We heard uh, Cheryl and Mary mention collaboration several times. So what are some of the partnerships that P&G has been engaged in, you know, in your efforts around the circular economy? Oh, absolutely. Collaboration is critical. Uh, three that I'd like to share today really speak to um, what, what I was mentioning, that we have to have the entire recycling value stream operating efficiently and effectively. So. Uh, Procter & Gamble is a founding member of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Uh, this is a cross-industry effort to identify and provide seed funding uh, primarily for the infrastructure needs to enable that uh, recycling value stream. So we're very proud to be a part of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, seeking out those opportunities where the gaps that are, are need to be filled are primarily funding related uh, and understanding that the seed money that can be uh, provided ends up being catalytic. It, it enables further funding uh, to put the systems in place that are needed to collect and then process uh, the plastic waste rather than landfilling or incinerating it today. Uh, another one that we're very proud to be a part of uh, is the Recycling Partnerships Polypropylene uh, Recycling Coalition. So uh, mentioned our, our efforts with pure cycle technology uh, this is an effort to ensure that in the U.S., consumers have access to collection and sorting of polypropylene. It is a highly valuable material. Uh, we want to ensure that the many municipalities have their system set up where consumers can put their polypropylene packaging into their recycle bin. Uh, the local MRF can sort it out into commodity bales uh, that are, are then sold uh, into the recycling industry for us to quite honestly have access to that uh, recycled material. Uh, and finally, a, another project that, uh, collaboration that we're really proud to have been a part of is material recovery for the future. Um, plastics and particularly plastics films are wonderful in their uh, economic and environmental benefit of reducing the amount of material used. They're a challenge to recover today though. Most municipalities really do not want this material in their bins uh, because quite honestly, plastic film is seen as poison to a MRF. Uh, as the material recovery facilities are designed today, it tends to gum up the operations, uh, really makes it difficult for them to run efficiently. So material recovery for the future made modifications to a, a material recovery facility in the Philadelphia area that today is collecting and sorting curbside uh, the flexible film packaging uh, that has been such an industry challenge in the past. They're generating bales of this flexible packaging material uh, for sale into the market. And we're looking for opportunities uh, through collaboratives to, excuse me, to expand this capability across more of the U.S. Well, we have uh, one question from the audience here, so let's let's uh, see if if uh, if this fits. Uh, as low oil prices have made uh, plastic made from virgin materials cheaper than plastic made from recycled products, can the recycling industry survive without a mandate to use the thirty percent recycled material from new plastic? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, and it's you know. It is true that uh, you know virgin plastic prices tend to move with the price of oil. Uh, several years ago, when uh, oil was significantly higher cost, uh, that that was a challenge of using the, the virgin material. And quite honestly, you know, the recycled material was, uh, in many cases, lower cost. Um, what we are trying to do is disconnect that pricing uh, from our decision making, and you see this across the consumer goods uh, companies that we're committing to using recycled resin. And once we start using PCR into our packaging, we don't back off. So it's our long-term commitment. We know that the industry needs that long-term commitment uh, as a value signal. So we don't ever look at a project as just a substitution of materials into the packaging. Uh, we do what we call holistic innovation. Uh, so as we are upgrading our packaging uh, by including PCR, we look at the product, we look at uh, the other benefits that we're offering to consumers. Um, we look at other ways that we could potentially save costs. So it's not a simple binary decision. Uh, through holistic innovation, uh, many times we're able to offset those costs. 
or to offer our consumers new and better benefits uh, through other parts of the initiatives that, that we're delivering to them. No, thanks so much. Um, really impressive, some of the innovation and partnerships that P&G has been involved in. Uh, I guess, are there any challenges? You mentioned the issue around uh, flexible packaging at, at MRFs. Are there other challenges that you're seeing in the recycling space that particularly relative to the to meeting your needs for recycled product? Yeah, the the biggest challenge, and it's been mentioned times uh, before and today, is the quality of the material uh, once it's been collected and sorted. Uh, this is particularly a challenge in the single stream system uh, for collecting recyclables that we have in the U.S. Um, it all comes down to sorting and the efficiency of that sorting in many cases. So um, we're really happy to be a part of the Holy Grail initiative, which is another collaborative that's looking at improving the sorting at a MRF so that we can get better and cleaner sorts of, of the materials, particularly plastic, um, by basically uh, hiding, if you will, uh, codes, barcodes throughout uh, the artwork of the packaging. It's called digital watermarking. It's fantastic because it's virtually invisible to the consumer, but it enables you in a material recovery facility to automatically sort based upon the brand uh, identification. So tied behind that, you can know what the packaging material and format is and ensure that it gets to the right stream. So that's going to drive a lot of efficiency in the system, which will help to drive down the cost and the challenges of contamination and quality. Uh, currently, this is in a pilot phase study in Europe. Uh, with over 80 companies a part of the, the collaborative to test this out real life. Uh, there will be products in the market uh, with packaging that has this Holy Grail digital watermarking technology. And there are MRFs that will be sorting based upon scanning the packaging and positively identifying which of the commodity bills that specific brand packaging needs to be sorted to. Well, thanks so much. Really appreciate uh, your time here, Brent. Uh, enjoyed the conversation, and we look forward to working with you um, as we push these issues forward. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Back to you, Marty. Well, let me again thank Chris, Cheryl, Mary, and Brent for joining us today. And Brent, thanks for the reminder about the Soapbox reference. I also just want to take a minute to thank the, the team from GEI and the broader chamber for all the work that goes into putting these events together, both the people you see on the screen and the many behind the scenes. And of course, finally, I just want to again thank our sponsor, Siemens Energy. Our next event is scheduled for September 30th, and the focus will be on hydrogen and how it will be an important factor in decarbonizing our economy. You can find the registration link in the chat box. So thank you again for joining us.